Well, the final two matches of the quarterfinals of the 2023-2024 African Champions League have been played, and now we know that Tipe Mazambi and Esperance Tunis will be joining Mamelodi Sundowns and Al Ahli in the semi-finals of our beloved tournament. Let's talk about it, though. My, as usual, my name is Mahir Mizahi. I'm your host of this African Five Aside podcast, um, and this podcast is brought to you by africasacountry.com. Um, and we'll begin by starting a, talking about the first match, Petro de Luanda, Atletico Petro, Petro Atletico de, de Luanda versus um, Tupuisson Mazembe, all-powerful Mazembe. Um, just a quick refresher. In the first leg, uh, this match finished nil-nil, and it wasn't a boring match. TP Mazembe at home in Lubumba, she created that atmosphere, and they created so many goal-scoring chances. Um, but they couldn't really score a single goal, and you could see that it was very frustrating for the coach, very frustrating for the players, and in the end, as they continued to fail scoring, uh, Petro actually started to grow into the game and have a few chances of their own. Um, so it, we came into this match with a you know a nil-nil on aggregate, and uh, as a result, you usually tend to favor the home side, um, especially, especially considering the fact that um, Petro Atletico, Atletico, Petro Atletico, Petrico, <laughs> Petro de Luanda um, haven't even conceded a goal this year uh, in the African Champions League. Um, I mean, to this date, until, until today's match. And so I think you would fancy them at home because of that. Um, remember, just a, a cliff notes of how these teams got here. Uh, TP Mazambi have built this insular mentality. Remember earlier on this year, um, their president, Moise Katumbi, the strongman of the Katanga region in the DRC, um, he, one of the richest men in, in Africa, or, or he was, I'm not sure if he still is, he contested the presidential elections. He lost the presidential elections. As a result, sometimes some people at the club feel like that they're either neglected by the government or sometimes that they're even picked on uh, by the government despite their success, despite the fact that they are, you know, the sole representative of the DRC uh, at this tournament. Um, throughout the group stages, Tipe Mazembe defended well and they've relied on um, a host of different strikers to sort of score uh, some of their goals. And they came into the season by sort of returning to the roots. They brought back their Senegalese coach, Lamin Ndiaye, a name that's very well respected on the continent uh, for, you know, the success he had with Tipe Mazembe earlier on, about a decade ago, um, you know, when it was the great Tipe Mazembe. Now they're sort of trying to return back to that age and, and trying to see if they can um, make Tipe Mazembe the great club it was, you know, throughout its history from the 1960s to present day. Petro, however, what's their story? So we, we told you that they've been defending very well. Petro, I think, in my opinion, are probably the African side, along with Sundowns, that invest the best in foreigners. And they do a great job of investing from the Americas. So the, the player that scored their goal today from is from Honduras, Jonathan Toro. Very, very good player. Um, Tiago Azulao. A lot of Brazilians uh, play, play for uh, Brazilians, Portuguese, like their defender, Pedro Pinto. Um, so, so these are the players that they, they tend to invest in. They tend to do it very well, I think, in my opinion, better than uh, teams around the rest of the continent when it comes to especially recruiting players from the Americas and Portugal. Um, and as a result, Petro, they, they, they tend to have older players because, you know, these are not players that jump at the chance of playing in Angola at the age of 21, 22. On the contrary, these are towards you know the end of their career. They have a lot of experience playing all around the world, um, but they're good players. And so they tend to be even like tactically disciplined. They keep a good shape and they try to beat you within their structure. Uh, this is why this was a, an interesting match because it was a clash of styles. TP Mazembe are, in my opinion, unstructured, undisciplined. They run all over the place. They use their pace, their power. Uh, they're very fun to watch in that sense. Um, but T but Petro is more like, we're going to make sure we keep our shape. We're going to try to move the ball and matriculate it up the pitch within our shape and score within our shape. They're not You don't see like their strikers making runs to the corner. Um, you don't see a player dribbling, you know, unless it's Gilberto, dribbling through five or six players. And so this is why I thought it was an interesting clash of styles. So let's talk about the match itself. Um, Petro went out on the front foot, as was expected. They're the home side. And they created, actually, chances. And this is something we have to keep an eye on for, for the next match for Mazembe as they play against Al-Ahli. Because Petro created their chances from either crosses or long throws um, early on in this match. And the first one, I think, came at the 10th minute. 
um, from across. And Jonathan Toro, I think, I think a cross came from the left wing, if I'm not mistaken. Thiago Azula headed it down to Jonathan Toro, who, if I'm recalling correctly, it's been it's been almost 12 hours since I watched this match. Took it on his chest and blazed it over the bar just wide, and from, from very close range. He should have done better. The Honduras international, um, and then the second one came from a long throw, and it was a very similar thing where you know the ball sort of finds its way to Jonathan Toro, and this time he does very well, turning on a half pence, slotting the ball in the in the low corner of the pitch. Um, and so this is surprising to me because, you know, Mzambi have really athletic, pretty tall center halves uh, in, uh, in Tabwe and Mondeco, um, and they're very aggressive as well. So I, I wasn't expecting Petro to unlock the Mzambi defense via long balls, especially ones like this long throw that you can sort of set up for and you're not really caught out of possession. That's something that we're going to have to see if, you know, the Ahli striker, Anthony Modes, can, can trouble them with. Anyways, um, I thought Petro did a good job of, you know, not getting a, a big head. They saw the rest of the first half pretty coolly in control. Um, although, although, they did give up a big chance before halftime. And this was not an insignificant chance because, you know, they say, like, the worst thing to do is to concede before halftime. But even if you concede a chance and not necessarily a goal, I think that can, um, you know, give a team hope going into the locker like hey come on we showed that we could do it let's let's do it let's do it again and get a goal and it can even plant seeds of doubt into the team that concedes a big chance i think that's what happened and even if you look at the way that the the chance was constructed it was philippe kinzumbi he found space between the um petro midfield and the 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 defense that half space between those two lines um and from there, he fed Oscar Cabwit, the very uh, exciting 18-year-old that we sort of discovered in the first leg. And Cabwit did a great job dribbling past a, a defender and, and past the goalkeeper. Uh, but he should have done a better job hitting the target. He, he slotted the ball just wide. Um, and he should have scored, really. And so that's one thing I thought was very interesting was, you know, Petro don't really have a, a staggered midfield. They were lining, it was like a 3-4-2-1. And between the three center halves and the four, uh, we'll say the two central midfielders and the two wing backs, you know, a lot of the times their, their lines were very like this straight. And so they're lucky that, in my opinion, it didn't come up against Sundowns because Sundowns are, are the masters of finding those spaces, you know, those half spaces in between the lines. And I was pretty disappointed with how Petro, you know, didn't communicate well enough to sort of make sure they snuff out those half spaces um, and not let the Mazembe players sort of nest there. Anyway, so the second half, that, that was really, if you again, look at the, the chances that Mazembe created. Many of them were because players picked up the ball in those half spaces. And it got to the point where they're creating so many chances and being so wasteful. And this is when I talk about Mazembe, you know, being undisciplined, unstructured, uh, like free spirits, but immature, maybe we can say. Um, and Lemmy Ninja, at one point, I remember he, he was walking up and down the touchline, like, <sighs> like almost hyperventilating, like, how can we be missing this many chances? The Mazembe coach. But that's how the, the goal ended up coming. Um, so remember, Petro up 1-0. If the scoreline stays the same, Petro advances uh, to play against um, Al Ahli. And if uh, they equalized, TP Mazembe equalized, then Mazembe would go on to play Al Ahli. And Mazembe ends up equalizing in the final 10 minutes of the match. And this time, it's uh, Fili Traore, it might be, uh, the, the Malian striker, who finds the same thing, the half space in between the defense and the midfield line. Um, wonderful piece of skill to sort of turn away from a defender. And then he finds, um, I believe it's Ibrahim Akeita, the Mauritanian right back, who's been absolutely fantastic throughout the Champions League, who passes the ball on to Philip Kinzumbi, who gets a shot on goal, it's deflected, and it bounces past the very experienced Angolan goalkeeper, uh, Marquez. And so at this point, um, Petro are, you know... Um, well, just before I talk about that, again, we talk about this, the strength of Mazembe, the striking options. Joel Beya, who ends up scoring the second goal, uh, from Lubumbashi, by the way, so remember, he's very highly motivated to represent this club. Philippe Kinzumbi, who scored the first goal. Oscar Kabwit, who had the chance before half. Philippe Traore, who comes on and makes a difference and is leading the Congolese league in scoring at the moment from Mali. Patient Mwamba, just 22 years old, a very talented uh, Congolese sort of shuttling, attacking midfielder that can join the attack. Uh, Sheikh Fofana, who we had as one of, you know, a top five youngster to look out for in the knockout stages, but he was injured for this match. And even somebody like uh, Sumana, the N Nigerian striker, 
a lot of great experience playing all around the continent. He wasn't used today. But they have so many striking options, and that's something that can make them very, very dangerous against Al Ahli. Um, so yeah, and, and then in the last few minutes of the match, Petro were just throwing everything forward, trying to find that winning goal. Um, and that's how they conceded the second goal. The goalkeeper went up on a corner kick. He stayed up for the long throw. And eventually, um, Mazembe did a great job of counterattacking. And Joel Beya uh, scores the winning goal, 2-1. And Mazembe come away with an absolutely fantastic victory. And it's great to see that Mazembe are sort of slowly building back to what they used to be. Because I think, you know, it, it's, it's nice to have great teams from different parts of Africa, you know, we have obviously sundowns in the southern part of Africa. We have, we've been missing the central part of Africa for a while. Now we have Mazembe that they're back, you know. Uh, a lot of, I think, Nigerian clubs are doing okay. Teams like Rivers United in West Africa or Asik Mimosa in West Africa. We need better and more in from West Africa. Uh, maybe, you know, like academy sides like Generation Foot or, or others. Um, the north we don't need to talk about. And now from the east we have the Tanzanian clubs. So I think it's great to have this sort of representation uh, from around the continent. Um, and, and and yeah, so it's great to see Mazembe back to, to where they were. And I think they're going to have a pretty cool match against Al Ahli uh, in two weeks' time. The second match of the day was uh, Azag Mimosa versus Esperance de Tunis in uh, Felicia in Abidjan. It was really great seeing the stadium again. Uh, it's where I spent a lot of my month of January at the African Cup of Nations. I, I stayed mostly in Abidjan and mostly went to, I think I went to every single match in that stadium. And it's such a beautiful stadium on the lagoon in Abidjan. And uh, yeah, just very nostalgic watching the, the match unfold there. Um, but this, you know, in the first match, uh, let's again go back and refresh our memories. Um, it was nil-nil <laughs> and there weren't many chances, unlike, you know, the Mazembe versus Petro first leg, which had many chances, especially for Mazembe. This one was nil-nil, um, very few chances. And what you have to understand is that ASEC they're also building up. You know, last year in the CAF Confederation Cup, they made it to the semifinals. And their modus operandi, like this year and like last year, is to really rely on very good uh, defending. So there are two center halves, one Lukuli Bali and Anthony Trabi, fantastic. And they're very complementary. Trabi is more physical, one Lukuli Bali is more of a passing uh, center half, and, and he builds the, the attacks and he's the link between the defense and the midfield. Uh, even uh, Zuzu, the left back, he reminds me so much of Eric Abidal, great player. And the goalkeeper, in my opinion, one of the most underrated goalkeepers in Africa, Charles Foli Ayayi. Um, Ivory Coast, their goalkeeper, and he has eight caps with the Ivorian national team. So, um, really, really great, tall goalkeeper, and um, and that's really the strength of that national team, or sorry, of of that club of Asik Mimosa. Um, and, and last year, you know, they had a great side, and they lost some of their best players, like Pakum Zuzwa, who goes to Young Africans, Mohamed Zugrana, who's having a great season with uh, MC of Algiers, the the league leaders in Algeria. Um, but still, they, they retain their identity because they retain their coach. The coach has been there for the better part of a decade. And, and really what they lean on is defending well and making sure they defend well. And then if there's a half chance, maybe we can try to snuff it. Um, Esperance de Tunis, for those that haven't been following, they're sort of going through a radical change. Um, most of their midfield and their attack attackers from last year are gone. Um, these are players that were very influential for so long at the club, like the Ivorian midfielder Fusani Koulibaly, uh, Mohamed Ali bin Ramadan, the Tunisian international, who is, I believe is in Hungary at the moment, uh, players like the Libyan winger Hamdou al um, Really, there are so many, uh, Anis al-Badri, who's, you know, there, 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 some, some of these players were there at the club for six, seven, eight years. Very influential, they were all older, and they really cleaned house, and they brought in brand new midfielders, players like Hussam Tqa, players like... Um, uh, Raji Ahulu, very good defensive midfielder to replace Koulibaly, for example. Uh, Usama Bouguera as a winger. Uh, Andre Buki as a winger. Um, and the, the Brazilians, Rodrigo Rodriguez and Yan Sass. Uh, Rodriguez is the striker, the, the, the spearhead. And Yan Sass is left-footed uh, right midfielder who, who's really the creative outlet for this Esperance team. So, so they, they cleaned the house. They brought in a bunch of brand new players, especially in attack. They just really kept the, 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 the defense intact. Um, you know, Tugay, uh, Mariah, Ben Ali, or Bushniba, and then uh, Ben Hamouda. So these are really the only real leftovers from last year's Esperance. And as a result, um, this Esperance side, in my opinion, is still one that's in construction, still one that's trying to find its identity. And it's not that harmonious in terms of 
uh, balance. They don't have as much attack as they, as they defend, you know. And so this was always going to be an ugly tie, and it finishes with zero goals after two matches. Um, still, when, they, when the match started, I was a little bit surprised that Asak Mimosa were so apprehensive at home. Um, after the first half, we had 46 to 54% possession. No big chances. The only sort of half chance was when the Esperance striker, Rodrigo Rodriguez, dispossessed Anthony Trebi, the, the Ivorian center half, races down on goal and, and they fails to even get a shot on goal. And that was like the main chance from the, the, the first half. 14 fouls. It was very choppy. Um, and the second half, believe it or not, was worse uh, <laughs> in terms of the amount of chances and shots created. So most of this game, if you watched it, was... Um, and, and they both play very, very similar tactical systems, 4-3-3. Three, three. And it was mostly the center halves of either club on the ball. And when the center halves were on the ball, they would expand. So you had the from, in the 4-3-3, three, three, the three midfielders, the deep line midfielder would drop down, and then the other two central midfielders would sort of shoot up. The fullbacks would get very wide and hug each touchline. But what happened was the opposing or the defending side, either side, was so focused on cutting off the passing lanes and making sure that the ball is not advanced. They weren't really putting pressure on the center halves that most of the time the center halves were just sitting on the ball, passing it to each other. Uh, and then eventually they're, you know, somebody tries a long ball, they're dispossessed, and it's the same thing over and over and over and over again. So um, you got to a point in the 60th, 70th minute where I think both sides realized, you know what, we're going to play for penalties. And um, because they did, I thought Asik had the advantage because they're at home. Um, the, the goalkeeper that I talked about, one of the most underrated ones in Africa, Charles Foley, he's 33 years old. He has a lot of experience. Whereas Esperance goalkeeper, Eman Lahmimish, another one of those players that we talked about as a, you know the five players to look out for in the knockout stages of the African Champions League, he's just 19 years old. And so he's very inexperienced. He hasn't been put in these positions before. Um, so I did think Asik had the, the advantage. Um, but Mimish was, was great. He saves uh, three penalties, if I'm not mistaken. And Esperance to Tunis advance uh, to face Mamelodi Sundown. So, hey, Esperance fans that were not happy online, uh, they think that they, the team is not good enough to face the likes of Al Ahli or Sundowns. But I think taking this cautious approach was okay against Asik Mimosa because Asik Mimosa were not a side that were going to very that were going to trouble you uh, in an attacking sense. So, don't take any caution, really, in my opinion. Um, I thought I was okay with Miguel Cardoso's approach to this match. Um, so yeah, that's it. We're in the semifinals now. In two weeks' time, we have Mamelodi Sundowns versus Esperance de Tunis and Al Ahli versus TV Mozambique. Absolutely wonderful semifinals. Um, I like that these last four teams are traditional powerhouses of the African continent, and uh, we're going to be following them, breaking them down uh, on this channel. We're going to be previewing all of those matches, doing analysis. Who knows? Maybe even getting to Tunis for for the match against Sundowns. Maybe even going to Egypt for the Mazembe match. Uh, I'd love to do that, but we'll see how, how things shake out. Um, anyways, thank you for uh, watching, listening. I saw that the, the previous breakdown of the Sundowns match against Yanga got a lot of traction online. So a lot of you are new to this channel. Um, thank you for subscribing. Thank you for watching. If you like uh, the kind of content that's being put out, please do like it. Please do subscribe. Please do share. And this content is going to continue to improve. I promise that. Um, it's been going down. It's been going slower than I than I really wanted to, um, but I do have uh, bigger and better in mind for the future. So, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, let me know what you thought of today's two matches, um, and what you think of the possible semi-final uh, matches in the future. All right, guys, I'll leave it there and take care and good night. Peace.